Welcome. Good morning here from Geneva. Um, good evening or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us online uh, for this uh, briefing session. We have kicked off yesterday um, the Jobs Reset Summit. Uh, was the day one about economic growth, revival and transformation. Today, we're going to um, start later today, um, the second day about um, work, wages and job creation. And um, we have just launched um, the new um, edition of our um, Future of Jobs report. So we're going to discuss here the key findings about this report. Um, and for that, um, I'm joined here by Sadia Zahidi, who is Managing Director of the World Economic, at the World Economic Forum and um, overlooking also um, the, um, this report. Um, we have uh, Karen Kimbrough, um, who is the Chief Economist from LinkedIn. And we have Emily Glassberg-Sands, who is um, the Head of Data Science at Coursera. And last but not least, we have uh, Hamoun Ektari, He's the Chief Ex Executive Officer of Future Fit AI. So welcome to our panel. Thanks uh, for being with us today. We are um, going to start with um, um, remarks from your side um, to explain a little bit the key findings. Um, and um, after that, we're going to jump into Q&A. &A, um, and uh, for the people joining us online, um, you can ask your questions directly in the chat and uh, we will read them out and try to answer them. So let's start um, with Sadia. Sadia, can you explain us a little bit, you know, what are the key findings? Um, wh what is uh, special, obviously, especially in this context of COVID-19 um, and what are the outcomes from this report? Thank you, thank you, Jan. Um, let me uh, immediately not answer your question by first <laughs> simply thanking the people that have um, worked to produce this report. So thank you to all of the data partners that are joining us, of course, in this session today. Um, so thanks to all of you, to LinkedIn, Coursera, to FutureFit AI, and also ADP. But let me also thank the, the, the people that produced this report. So in particular, Veselina Ratcheva for her leadership of the entire project, um, and Guillaume Hingle and Sophie Brown for their very important contributions. Um, it's, it's really been a sort of team effort. And I think you'll see from the richness of the report, there is a lot in there to be learned about the future of jobs. Let me try to offer um, a, a, a first response, Jan, to, to your question, which is that we are starting to see a double disruption scenario become uh, the reality for most workers today. So on the one hand, there has been this long-term ongoing trend of automation and digitization that is starting to displace certain tasks, which is then starting to displace certain jobs. That trend is speeding up. And in addition, there is, of course, the pandemic-induced recession that is contracting certain parts of the economy and making it much harder for workers to be able to move into their future roles. Now, that said, we are still overall cautiously optimistic. And that is because the rate of, while the rate of job destruction is increasing and the rate of job creation is decreasing, net, when we look out to 2025, the outlook is still positive. We still expect slightly more jobs to be created than destroyed. And at the same time, if we put in place proactive efforts today to reskill, upskill, and help transition workers from job A to job B, I think we can get there, but it is going to require those proactive efforts. I'll stop there and back over to you, Jan. Thank you, Sadia. Karen, um, from your side, what do you think? What do you think are really the the, the key outcomes um, that that we should um, talk about and and also address in in the coming days um, during our um, job reset summit? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks again for having me. And um, I think what I would probably want to highlight are um, in pretty quick order are just maybe three things. Um, first, you know, in terms of our own hiring data. We continue to see um, the hiring recovery as we measure it on LinkedIn's platform continue, but it is definitely slowing down from a more um, kind of notable rebound that we saw over the summer. So hiring seems to be um, very correlated with shutdowns um, and reopenings. And so as we enter these waves of maybe 
more targeted shutdowns across Europe, in the US and elsewhere, um, it does kind of create speed bumps for the hiring pace. So our hiring rates were improving, but every time there's a shutdown, they, they, they tend to kind of retrench a little bit. Um, so I think it's going to be a little bit stop and start in terms of the recovery from here on. One, the second thing I would maybe call out really quickly before I, I want to talk about skills as well, but the second thing I would call out really quickly is just um, one of the things we noticed in the hiring rate is the impact on women. When there are shutdowns, um, it seems to be posing a disproportionate burden on women. Um, it was really interesting to us. We saw this happen in March and April where women's share of total new hiring just dropped by three to five percentage points globally. Um, and it was pretty uh, notable that for several months, women just weren't um, weren't applying and weren't um, changing jobs. I think a lot of uncertainty was a factor. I think additional child care, additional elder care, um, a disruption in the routine. Um, probably just meant they were uh, overburdened. Um, so the the real near term, you know, aspect of this that's a problem is that women seem to be have lost a little bit of ground temporarily. They 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 tend to kind of speed up again as uh, things reopen. But every time we close down again, uh, we see women's hiring take another step back. So I think over time that accumulates, and that's worrisome. Um, and we see it in the official data as well um, here in the U.S. where I'm sitting right now that, you know, a lot of the uh, improvement in like cosmetic unemployment rates is really masking people exiting the labor force, um, not stopping looking. So I think that's that's a problem because that's the transition we don't want to see. We want to see transitions in the future of work that uh, cause people to look at their, their skill set, find something adjacent and move into what we call new emerging jobs. And um, so before I, you know, um, leave you on too negative a note, let me just point out that we do think there are many, many um, emerging jobs. Um, we think that the future of work is digital. We see huge demand for digital skills across a spectrum of jobs, uh, but it's also human. We see a lot of demand for human skills, collaboration, compassion, believe it or not, negotiation, uh, management. So. So the future of work is digital. It's also human. And maybe where I would, I would uh, leave you with my final thought is just to say, when you think about what are these new jobs, where are these new jobs emerging, where are they clustering? We're seeing, in fact, that um, if the cluster is, say, in product development and in data and in AI, what's really, uh, I think, good news is that people who are able to make the transitions into those those clusters, most, most of them come from other occupations. So whenever a new job, let me say it in plain English, whenever a new job kind of is emerging, it's so new that almost anybody has can find a doorway or an access into it. You don't have to have such a narrow skill set to access this new emerging job cluster. So the good news is that it's sort of a greenfield site. Um, and that's quite different than, say, some more traditional job clusters like engineering or people and culture, which have very sort of more narrow and defined skill sets. So, you know, broad, broadly speaking, I think that we do see a lot of promise in the data, the IA space. Um, but the good news is that you can come from just about anywhere and, and manage to make that transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Um... For, for your comments here. And um, I would like to go to, uh, to Emily. I mean, the future of work is already here. Um, in your eyes, what does it look like? Yeah, thank you, Jan, and, and pleasure to be here. You know, we've heard from Sadia and Karen how COVID has accelerated this arrival of the future of work. It, in 2025, we think employers will about equally divide work between humans and machines and automation will displace 85 million jobs. And as Sadia so eloquently put, enough new jobs will pop up, but we need to prepare people for them. So for workers who remain in their role in the next five years, almost half are going to need to be reskilling in core competencies for that role. And those are the lucky ones. So the pandemic is disproportionately impacting the already disadvantaged. Displaced workers are more likely to be, yes, uh, female, as Karen pointed out, also to have had lower wages and lower educational attainment. And so, you know, what really fascinates me is the opportunity now for educators and businesses and governments 
to come together, to adapt, to accelerate the reskilling revolution, to meet this acceleration that we're seeing in the future of work. And companies can, and in many cases are doing their part, investing in reskilling their employees. 95% um, of business leaders this year report expecting employees to pick up new skills on the job, which is just a dramatic increase from a couple years ago. But companies alone are not enough. The recovery needs to involve coordinated reskilling efforts by institutions, including governments, so that we're providing accessible job relevant learning also to the least advantaged, many of whom are not currently employed. They could be unemployed, they could be underemployed, or they could have stated um, that they exited uh, the labor market. Um, the good news, I think, is that we've already seen the world responding and responding relatively quickly. That includes turning to online learning for broad access to job relevant skills. Uh, on Coursera, we've seen a surge in demand across the platform. We're humbled to be able to serve uh, learners at this time relative to just before the pandemic, to give you a sense, there are four times as many individuals now enrolling in online learning on Coursera under their own initiative. So since mid-March, more than 23 million new learners have joined the platform. We've seen over 60 million new enrollments. Equally, employers are now offering their workers online learning opportunities at five times the rate of before the pandemic. So really stepping up. And I think most striking, nine times as many individuals are enrolling in online learning through our government programs aimed at workforce development for the unemployed or underemployed. And so, you know, there's a lot of challenge. There's a lot of tough news. The increased rate of change we're seeing in the labor market uh, really is demanding universal access to job relevant learning and it's becoming essential for the functioning of our families, of our societies, of our economies. And, you know, I've been deeply inspired by how a whole community of educators and enterprise businesses and governments are prioritizing serving the world um, with generosity and innovation and dedication. And it also stands out that there is so much more to do because this acceleration isn't going anywhere. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, Hamoun, um, automation is, is a word that we, we see a lot in this report. Um, wh what is the real human impact and wh what can be done and, and, and how you know, should we adapt? Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, for us, when we look at that human impact in conversations with people who have been impacted by layoffs, three words keep coming up over and over that they choose to use, lost, ashamed, confused. And these, when we speak to them, uh, their response is not only have I lost work, it is also a sense of loss of identity and dignity. It feels like sometimes a COVID staple to wake up to yet another headline of thousands of workers having been laid off. But it's really important that we don't allow that to desensitize us to those human impacts that you mentioned of disruption, automation, and, and transformation. And layoffs are merely just one example of those, impact, uh, those impacts on humans. So when we think about young people around the world trying to find their way, immigrants, refugees, veterans, uh, those even with a criminal background trying to be recognized for the skills they already have, women and minorities, as was mentioned, simply expecting to be valued for their contributions on par with everybody else, those are the communities that are most affected by the twin factors that the report described. And as Sadia and Emily and Karen mentioned, the Future of Jobs report provides this data-driven foundation for what is happening, what is coming, and what that means for people, companies, and governments. With that foundation in place and at our fingertips though, I think what the report then challenges all of us to choose it is to make fundamental choices. So are we going to simply sit back, wait for another two years so that we get a chance to read the next iteration of the report? Do we choose to continue with what often can be high level statements and surface level initiatives that don't go far enough and just keep us playing catch up? Or I think where the report points us to is to look in the mirror, ask some of the tough questions around how good is good enough? How big is big enough? How fast is fast enough? And get on with that work of designing and delivering the type of high quality, high scalability investments that are actually going to move the needle for significant number, number of people around the world. And if we do choose to go with that path, that path of taking the most audacious route to actually addressing the challenge at scale, 
that that's going to demand of us and of of leaders in companies and in government and, and in society to make some fundamental shifts in mindsets in policies and in actions and and just to call out a few of those shifts they include going from talking about 21st century and future skills for what now is about 50 years to actually developing predictable and scalable models of radically improving some of those skills that Emily uh, and, and Karen touched on in anybody, anywhere, from assuming everybody should become a coder to understanding that humans aren't just widgets that we can put into jobs and their interests and passions matter when they choose what transition path they want to take. From selling what often is an unrealistic narrative of everyone becoming a unicorn entrepreneur to investing in the infrastructure that's necessary to support small business owners and free freelancers, which are much more common transition paths for people in the new world of work. From promoting what often might be only the sexy technology jobs to what we describe at Future Fit AI as hidden good jobs, and the report refers to from a few different angles, whether those are in, hosp uh, in, in healthcare, whether they're in uh, education, in people and culture. Uh, also shifts from paying for simply program enrollments and course completions to actually paying for successful transitions from job A to job B. And then finally, from measuring aggregate job growth to zooming into what are quality, sustainable work opportunities that are being created. And perhaps what I'll finish with is, you know, we've uh, a feature for the AI, we've been honored to have a chance to contribute to the report, but are most excited to continue to play a part uh, under Saudi's leadership and, and uh, along with other partners at the Reskilling Revolution as a platform that hopefully can and has the chance of moving those significant needles on a problem that perhaps you could look at as one of the top two challenges we face in the next decade, but also in this century. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hamoun. Um, and uh, certainly, we're going to continue to, uh, as I mentioned, um, this week and, and further on doing the Jobs uh, Reset Summit to address these topics. Um, so we going to go now into the Q&A part. Um, we have a, a first um, a first question coming uh, from Singapore, um, Shefali Riki um, from Straits Times. Um, do we have Shefali? Yes. Um, Shefali, please, um, your question. Can you hear me? You very well, thank you. Great, um, it's really good to be joining you in this uh, remote fashion. Um, I've gone through uh, parts of your report and I haven't really um, gone through all the insights, but it does seem to give a lot of hope. My question was really about, um, you know, do you see most of the disruption happening in the Asia region? You know, given the size of the population, the technology uh, advances that are happening. So especially when you talk about 85 million uh, jobs being uh, displaced due to automation and 97 million new jobs being created. I also had a second question, and that's about uh, Singapore. The report mentions in one place that the acceleration in terms of automation is happening at a slightly slower rate than the global average. And I was wondering, how do you explain that? Um, is it largely because much of it is already automated? I'd like to hear your views on that. Sadia, would you like to, to start maybe sure. on Asia, on Singapore? Sure. I can, I can take a first shot at it, and then I think um, I'm sure others will have more to, more to contribute. Um, you're absolutely right that there are differences by country and by region. And in some cases, it is because of the existing rate of digitization and automation across that particular economy, um, where that is today, how much that's getting sped up. There's another aspect, which is um, how much are companies in that particular country or region already putting in place work from home policies or, um, or other ways in, in which work can be digitized. So there's an element of this which is about the individual, there's an element of this which is about sort of the, the uh, basic underlying economic structure um, where most of the economic activity in that sector is. So there are huge differences by countries, but the overall trend, and this is of course the results of information from medium and large companies from uh, across the 26 economies that we were able to cover, from across the 15 different industry sectors. I think where we have a blind spot, and I also want to be sort of very upfront on that, 
is the what is happening in, for example, the care economy or what is happening in more of the blue collar workforce. This is most certainly more of the results of white collar workforce or very large companies and their sort of broader value chains. So there is a, a mix of information that we're seeing here. In terms of um, Singapore specifically, I think this depends again on the types of proactive policies are in, that are in place. To some extent, the rate of disruption or change is higher in those places which are not prepared for absorbing it. And Singapore is not only a leader in terms of the types of skills that people are able to acquire, but now the new efforts that are being put in place for supporting people through job transitions, mapping out what are the jobs of the future. And so when it comes to the Nordic countries, when it comes to countries like Singapore, there is definitely an advantage in terms of preparedness. And that is why perhaps some of that disruption is seen at a slightly smaller scale than it is in other economies that are less prepared. Thank you, Sadia. Um, do we have Karen, Amelia, or Hamun? You, you would like to, to add anything to that? I, I um, unfortunately, I think I, I would only just be agreeing with uh, Sadia there. Um, from what we've done um, in our own work, um, we've definitely seen that Singapore seems to be a leader in that space. And so um, my estimation is that um, it's just, as Sadia said, the, the, the road has been paved already, so they're starting a little bit further ahead. Thank you very much, Karen. Good, then we can move on to the second question. Um, we have uh, Pranjal Sharma um, from Business Standard in India. Um, is Pranjal with us? Yes, we can see you, Pranjal. I think you're still on mute. Unmute for the moment. Yes, you're unmuted. So please, your question, Pranjal. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, very, very timely report. Uh, Sadia addressed one of the thoughts that I had, but I think I'd like to uh, get deeper into that. You know, the whole transition piece uh, sounds very, very smart, but actually it's very difficult. Uh, you know, the impact on uh, the job loss is really mostly on, on blue collar uh, workers uh, white collar workers have a better ability. My basic question is that when you talk about transitioning and Karen referred to that earlier as well, you know, the prep for transition itself is a huge effort. Everybody cannot just transition to these new 95 million jobs which are happening. And I don't know whether you have assessed whether the 85 million which are lost versus the 95 million which are created, what is the, you know, overlap between them? If you do a Venn diagram, for instance. Um, the real effort, and I think which is where the countries, policymakers and enterprises really need to focus is how do we get this transition uh, enabled for people? Plus, what is the time required? Is it going to be too slow and too late for a lot of people? And that's what I think the real fears are across the world. I mean, both in emerging economies and in developed countries. Thank you for the, the question. I, I would see these two ends of the spectrum as, so, so you've got the, the 85 million that are being disrupted, the 95 million that are being created, but there is a, a massive um, a part of, of, of jobs in the middle that are maybe not necessarily fundamentally disappearing or fundamentally growing, but the skills range within them is completely changing. So one of the other messages that comes out of the report is that for um, the average job, the average change in the core skills is 40%. So I think overall, one big part of the answer is reskilling and upskilling at a massive scale. Now, of course, online learning platforms are particularly helpful for the white collar workforce, but for the blue collar workforce, we actually need to go back to a system that has existed for you know, 40 or 50 years at least in some parts of the world, which is the um, traditional vocational training system. And that exists in countries like India, in other parts of South Asia, but equally some of the leaders in the world on that are in you know, Switzerland or Austria or Germany. So that TVET system does have to be not only brought back, but has to be upgraded. And the certifications and skills that are provided through that system have to become a whole lot more rapid, much better recognized, and we have to sort of revalue that work. And maybe one other element I'd add there is We've all just seen through the pandemic 
who were truly the frontline workers, who were the people that kept the engines of the economy going. And that was the people that were working in the grocery stores, the people who were the postal workers, um, nurses and care workers. And so I, I think there is an overall collective revaluing of certain professions that are either blue collar or white collar, but require much more in-person work um, than some of the work that can very easily be automated and digitized. So I think that's, that's a, in the long term, that is going to be a positive in terms of the recognition of um, that form of work and a revaluation by all of our societies of that work. So there will need to be a change in both the blue collar work upskilling and reskilling as well as the white collar work reskilling and upskilling. And very quickly on your point on job transitions, that is another system which exists in certain parts of society but will, or certain societies, but will need a major upgrade, which is if you think about the traditional um, career center or job center, these are very community-based, localized support systems. There will need to be much greater strengthening, much more investment in those, in addition to providing a lot more of those type of services online. So some amount of proactive support for making those transitions is also necessary. And third point, and I'll, I'll stop after that, is at the moment with the crisis, governments in advanced economies in particular, but also in emerging markets, are distributing enormous amounts of funds to support workers, to provide wage support, to provide support to businesses, to be able to keep their workers for longer. We now need to move into a new phase of this. And that phase has to build into it incentives for reskilling, upskilling, and some of those job transitions. Now that takes different forms in different parts of the world, but this is the kind of nuance that governments, governments will need to move towards. It's not just an era of bigger government, it's also an era of requiring bolder government. Thank you, Sadia. Anything to add from, from our other panelists uh, to uh, Pranjal's question? Yes, Karen, please. Yeah, just very quickly, I wanted to acknowledge it's a really good point about the um, transitions are not always um, as seamless as I think we'd like to make them. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in our data is that um, when you break out um, the resilience of workers to make transitions, um, those workers with the most disruptive digital skill sets have made the fastest transitions. So if you are already very knowledgeable about cloud computing or large data storage, um, there's probably a job waiting for you, correct? Um, and if you have very basic digital literacy at the other end of the spectrum, the rebound, at least by our data, has been slower for you um, in terms of getting hired. And the transition has probably been a lot bumpier. So I don't have anything to add to what um, my, um, you know, co-panelists have already said, but I just wanted to acknowledge that, that that transition really does depend on your starting point again. And I think having disruptive digital skills is obviously a massive advantage. Thank you very much, Karen. And Emily, you wanted to, to add also? Yes, I so I agree completely with, with Sadia and Karen. And I also think it's important to remember that when we talk about jobs that are being created by automation, it's easy to think about the data scientist or the software engineer, uh, but there are a lot of jobs that are administrative of technology that can often be easier transition points for folks who are moving out of uh, blue collar blue collar positions. So one example is uh, Google IT support specialist. There are thousands of companies around the world that use uh, Google. Uh, Google Cloud, Google Drive, many of you engage with Gmail and Google calendars. Those folks need IT support specialists uh, working with their employees, helping them understand how to debug Google. And there is a fantastic training. It takes six to eight months. Um, it's all online on Coursera called the Google IT um, support specialist certification. And it takes people who, most of whom don't yet have a college degree and prepares them uh, for jobs uh, in, this, in this role. Uh, and Google also works with their customers uh, to match graduates of that program uh, with jobs uh, at their clients. And there are many other analogs, a Salesforce administrator is one, but as we think about technology, as we think about cloud, it's easy to think about sort of the very uh, tip of sort of Maslow's hierarchy of data needs or technology needs or cloud needs, but we also must remember that that foundation 
is built on folks who are largely administrators of that technology. And that is a more natural shift that we're seeing, um, especially for folks who are being displaced by uh, in, in current blue collar jobs. The other thing I will say is some of the most inspiring uh, stories that we see in the data are the stories of people who say, take the Google IT support certificate, transition into that role. And while working in that role, then up level in a master's of computer, or sorry, a bachelor's of computer science, despite the fact that they never had a bachelor's before. So thinking about these stackable educational programs where you earn a certificate that unlocks a job. And while you're working in that job, you're able to build that certificate into a full diploma bearing degree that can ultimately unlock a white collar job. It's a long path. It's not an easy path. It requires the support of an employer, if you're employed, of a government, if you're unemployed, of your communities and your families, but it's inspiring and it's what we're seeing. And it is um, it is less the exception um, than I think we're, we're tempted to believe when we only think of you know, data scientists and software engineers as the roles that technology is creating. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, we have another live question, unless uh, Hamoun, anything you would like to add um, also to Pranjal's question, how to master the transition. Sure, yeah, and perhaps just very quickly, Pranjal, I think in a lot of ways you hit uh, on, kind of on the head the, the crux of this, right? That we can look at the starting point and the end point, but the transition in between is where the significant complexity shows up. And we spend a lot of our time using technology and data, but in, in conversation with people going through those individual personalized transitions, and I would call out probably the three common pitfalls we see that's worthwhile considering as we think about the response to this. The first is the majority of our current public and private sector investments in this space are singular interventions, right? It's either an inv investment in skills development or an investment in may maybe resume and networking support. But the reality of an individual's transition when you look at the underlying data is it's gonna take a package of supports. It's gonna need a bit of career readiness stuff, some coaching and guidance, hopefully uh, uh, the right skill training targeted to what they need, access to human support, even if that's virtual, to help them make sense of that. But we don't have a lot of investments in those uh, flexible uh, co combined packages of support. The second risk is a lot of the jobs that get created, they get filled, and, and Karen mentioned this, by people who are already pretty ready for it, they might already be in a job and they're jumping over. So there is work to be done on the demand side with employers to significantly prioritize those who are further from the center into those, especially the most accessible roles that Emily was touching on. And then I would say the third risk when it comes to these transition to truly manage that transition to be successful is you know, money does talk, whether it's private or public investment, and we've got to start paying for the things that actually matter. An example we have seen are, are companies and governments paying for distance traveled of someone from A, even if it's not fully to B. So if it's someone at 60% readiness, getting them to 80% actually costs a lot more per unit than it does getting someone from 95% to 100%. And so how do we make sure we make indiscriminate investments in supporting those furthest from the center with wraparound supports, combination of technology and human supports, and then work on the demand side to make sure these 95 million that are gonna be created are used for those who need it most. Thank you very much, Amun. Um, we have another live question. Um, Kelt Louis Pedersen from Denmark, uh, from Jyllandsposten. Um, Kel, can you hear us? Yes. Um, so please go ahead with your question. Uh, one second, we, we don't hear you. Can we unmute um, Kelt Louis Peterson? Doesn't seem to be a mute. Can you try again? No, unfortunately we we can't hear you. So what I will do is I will read out one question in the studio. Can you please test with, with Cal Louis just so we get the sound? I'll read out one question. We received them in the chat. Um, so we have a question from Arti Nagraj from Gulf, 
golf business uh, to all of our panelists. Um, so how many workers do you expect will be upskilled in time to correspond with the loss in job roles due to automation? Um, anybody wants to go first to address that question? I can make maybe yeah, Sadia, one, one uh, get to, to get the ball rolling. Um, I think it will depend to some extent on uh, the, the financing and the incentives that are available. But what it has become very clear is most businesses actually do see that there is a return on investment within one year. Um, from having invested in reskilling and upskilling their workers. So one would think that the business case is there. I think why it's become quite hard at the moment is that businesses are having to take very, very short term decisions because of the current nature of the economic downturn and the constraints that they're facing. And that's where um, I, I think this element of stakeholder capitalism comes in. This is the moment for many large businesses to sort of live up to um, the, the um, conversation around stakeholder capitalism and to take on board that medium to long-term investment that needs to be made in workers to help them with the transitions that need to, that, that they can, um, that they can make. And at the same time, ensure that even in cases where there are wholly redundant roles, some level of support is provided to those workers to help them transition to their next role, even if it's outside of the company and outside of their industry. And there are some companies that we are working with. In fact, we're going to have an announcement later today um, in the outcome session here at the Jobs Reset Summit um, for uh, companies that have come together and formed a coalition to do exactly that, to put the long-term return on investment in mind rather than just the very short-term constraints that they're facing. Thank you, Sadia. Karen, Emily, or Hamoun, you want to come in on, on this question? Perhaps just a, a quick comment on that question of how long would this take and how many people could we put through it. I think to Sadio's point, there is dependency on the types of investments that are made. But I think what the data bears out quite clearly is if you take uh, just about anyone who might be impacted with the right levels of both training, wraparound supports, anywhere between a six to 12 month mark, you could meaningfully land them in an opportunity that is sustainable over time or at a minimum sets them up on a step ladder to more and more sustainable and lower risk opportunities. What's interesting from a funding perspective is depending on the profile of the person, their background, the supports they already have in place and the skills they might be starting from, the cost of that transition can range from anywhere in the order of magnitude of $50 and they do it on their own on, a, on an on online platform without any human support to give or take around $10,000 if they are starting from a very frontline role, trying to transition into a meaningfully higher order from a quality of job perspective opportunity and require some of those wraparound supports to make that transition successfully. And so I think that's where that, that range, then the question becomes, how do we bring together the right stakeholders to fund that at the right scale and the right level so that the sufficient number of people, especially those who need it most, can take advantage of the new opportunity? And I will add only that governments, in addition to enterprises, will be critical to reaching the scale of reskilling that we need. Um, Coursera on, on April 24th launched our Coursera for Workforce Recovery Initiative aimed at helping governments provide unemployed citizens with free access to job relevant learning on Coursera. And we've seen huge uptake. We've activated over 325 programs, more than 70 countries, 30 US states and cities. Um, 700,000 unemployed workers have already received access on Coursera through their governments. They've enrolled in just shy of 3 million courses, preparing especially for fast growing entry level jobs in IT, healthcare, business. Um, and, it's, and it's been astounding and it's only the beginning. So countries with active programs range from you know, Albania to Greece, to Singapore, to Ukraine. And as you know, Hamoun so aptly put it, the wraparound services are really critical to the success. So in one example, Costa Rica's government has worked with local employers across the country to identify current job openings and their skill requests. 
Then they've built live learning programs on Coursera that teach those skills. And then they're connecting graduates with the relevant skills directly to the hiring companies. Um, in another example, US um, state of Maine, their Department of Labor is targeting uh, specific skills that help workers qualify for open jobs, think project management, Excel, and they've also authorized Coursera as a viable work search activity. So um, making sure that folks who are in the process of searching for a job are supported in getting education as part of that search so that search can be successful and so that they can be up leveling in their careers. So absolutely we need companies on board um, and individuals play a critical role, but so do governments. And I think the scale that we'll reach will be largely determined by those private public partnerships um, and how effectively uh, we can build those for the world. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we give it one more try, um, Claus Louis Peterson uh, from Denmark. Um, let's let's see if we can hear you. Otherwise, we, I can read out your question. I received it also in, in written. Carl, can you try? Uh, I'm, unfortunately, no. The, the audio does not work. Um, but uh, I have received your question. So. Um, your question is, one of the findings in the report is that 84% of employers see the potential move, uh, see the potential move 44% of their workforce forced to operate remotely. Since the lockdown, millions have worked from home and many want to keep do doing so. How many jobs will be lost, especially among the unskilled in the service and transport sectors in city centers? And what will be the overall effect on urbanization? Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it started, but I think everyone here has, has a lot of information on the different parts of this puzzle. So um, the ILO, um, since the beginning of the lockdowns, has been trying to trace what it means for some of the office closures and, and what kind of job losses that creates. So in this particular quarter, if we think about the office closures, the cumulative office closures, and what that means in terms of the number of um, hours lost, that's the equivalent of 345 million FTE that are lost across the world. So you're absolutely right that there is some element of this that simply cannot move to remote work. And there is a large set of people that are not able to perform their work online and also don't happen to be frontline workers that are essential to most societies. And so there you are seeing some of that contraction. Now, as to whether that is permanent, I think is going to depend on what happens with the pandemic itself, back to the health crisis itself and how fast we come out of it. So there are certain sectors where, for example, take aviation, travel, tourism, some of these companies will not necessarily be able to continue to maintain their current staff. I think we're starting to see that. There have been massive layoffs, for example, in aviation. In certain societies, governments have provided that support. But in the longer term, we might be looking at a structural shift where there, there aren't necessarily jobs to come back to or that sector may not revive incredibly fast. Now, there are other parts of society where I think if you, if you look also at some of the data, for example, from China, from some of the countries that emerge from that first wave of lockdowns, some parts of sort of human behavior and societal behavior went kind of back to quote unquote normal relatively quickly. And that applies to, for example, services, entertainment, um, you know, eating out, et cetera. Some of those behaviors went back to normal relatively quickly. And so there may be a faster bounce back in those sectors. So I think it's going to depend very much on which sectors and then what that composition is off a particular economy, how many people come from a sector that may not recover fast and how many come from a sector that does. Thank you, Sadia. We're almost uh, finished um, this briefing. Um, well, we, have a, we have a minute left, Karen yes. Uh, Karen, uh, Karen, you would like to... Um, Could I add something? to that answer? Um, I just wanted to share some information that we have. So we, we have the opportunity at LinkedIn to look also at migration data, which allows us to see how people when they update their profile, we can see uh, where they are and if they've moved. Um, and what we're seeing is indeed people are leaving certain cities, um, not all, but often large, densely populated and um, expensive cities uh, for what we call like second tier metropolitan areas. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is um, this migration from certain cities, but not all cities, um, which we think is probably temporary and not permanent. But again, that's speculation. 
We don't have particular data that tells us whether that's permanent or not. Uh, the second thing that we're seeing is that people are increasingly looking for remote work. So we saw a fourfold increase in the jobs that were um, um, advertised or posted on our, our websites um, that are remote or advertising work from home. We saw a threefold increase in people who are actually searching when they come job seekers are looking for remote work. So all this since March is these massive increases uh, worldwide in the hunt for remote work. Um, still, that's it only adds up to being a fraction of the total amount of work that's available. So there are many people who won't be eligible or find remote work in their sector. And when we ask and survey our members, there are definitely sectors where remote work doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you're in construction, again, travel, as Satya said. Um, so there are sectors where it's not really uh, convenient. Um, but one, one of the things I wanna say, and I'll close here because I know time is short, is I think we need to think about um, what work is gonna look like if there are successive pandemics, because this is just one, this is one virus, but there's no reason to think there won't be another type of health scare or pandemic in the future that's gonna force us to have to reshuffle. So the trick in all this is to be as resilient as possible, whether workers are resilient and they have these portable skills, whether cities are set up to flex as need be to protect safety. Um, and I think that's going to be the trick going forward is setting up for the risk that there might be other pandemics in the future. Thank you very much.